There is a global experiment that's performed on about 1.6 billion people across 70 countries twice a year, and it's called daylight savings time. Now, in the spring, when we lose one hour of sleep, we see a 24% increase in heart attacks the following day. That Yet so in the crazy. autumn, in the fall, we see a 21% decrease in heart attacks. So what we know is that a lack of sleep um, will impact just about every major physiological system in your body and almost every operation of your mind. For example, if I were to take you and limit you to just four hours of sleep for one single night, there is almost a 70% drop in what we call natural killer cell activity, which are critical anti-cancer fighting immune cells. That's after one night of four hours of sleep. That's crazy. Secondly, if I were to short sleep you for just one week, your levels of testosterone would be that of someone 10 years your senior. Define short sleep. What, how many hours are so we talking So here about? we could be talking about four to five hours a night for four or five nights in a row, okay. which if you look at the data on the survey, that's not unusual for perhaps even 20 to 30% of the population, certainly during the week. Now, you collide all of that information together as well as the impact on the brain, the mental health issues regarding anxiety, suicidality, depression, as well as increased risk for Alzheimer's disease, and we've been uh, seeing that as well. Um, all of these things created this perfect storm for Guinness to take a step back. They used to recognize world record-breaking attempts. And to put this in context, you know, several years ago, a remarkable individual, I think his name was Felix Baumgartner, an Austrian, um, with Red Bull, he went up in a space capsule. He went to the outer edges of our atmosphere, of our planet. He opened the door, and then in a spacesuit, he jumped out. He hurtled back down to Earth at over a thousand kilometers per hour. He broke the sound barrier with his body. <laughs> and Guinness says, that's just fine. However, sleep deprivation attempts no longer because they are that much more concerning to your mental, your physical, and your cognitive health. I have two sleeping problems. One is that there are times where I will get um, either really stressed or I'll get really excited. And I have a very easy time falling asleep, but then I'll wake up after three or four hours and I find it very difficult to fall back asleep. And then the second part, just so I don't forget, is sleep inertia in the morning. But what can I do to um, optimize for staying asleep? Yeah, so there it's a case of trying to deal with that sort of downgrade the activation of the nervous system. The reason that people typically wake up uh, in the middle of the night and can't get back to sleep, not always, but often, is because they have this sort of stress relief, they're carrying this anxiety. And anxiety biologically is the principal mechanism that we think underlies most insomnia. And what happens in part is that the fight or flight branch of the nervous system becomes overactive. And that's exactly why the does opposite. it shut down? Like I find it so easy to fall asleep, but I can tell on the nights where right. I'm gonna wake up. Yeah. It just seems and weird that it dips, because, but then my subconscious mind kicks it back alive. Yeah, why Why would it be that way? And the reason is because after about 16 hours of wakefulness, you've built up a lot of that healthy sleepiness, what we call sleep pressure. And the longer that you're awake, the more of that sleep pressure builds up. And it's a chemical that builds up in the brain called adenosine. And then when we go into sleep, it's the time when the brain can actually start to clear out that adenosine. And it's, so it starts to lower the sleep pressure. And after about eight hours of sleep, you've cleared away 16 hours of that adenosine, of that sleepiness. And so you wake up naturally and you feel refreshed and restored. But what will happen is that you can be stressed and sort of, or excited, but the sleepiness, the weight of sleepiness pulling you down is so heavy at that point that you can get to sleep. But then three or four hours later, you jettisoned maybe 50% of all of that adenosine, maybe even more, because it principally happens during deep sleep. And so now your brain is much more vulnerable to those awakenings because it doesn't have the weight of that sleepiness. If you wake up and you can't get back to sleep, don't stay in bed awake for too long though. Don't go to work, don't start checking emails, don't eat because it trains the brain to expect food. But instead in a dim room, somewhere different, so you change the context, so you're changing the learned association. 
just read a book, listen to an audio book, um, meditate in dim light. All of these things are great. Find out whatever works for you. And then only when you're sleepy do you return to bed. And there's no time limit for that. And that way you train the brain back out of a bad association that it's learned, which is my bed is this place of being awake, which if you repeat that over time, you become trained to be awake in the bed. And then you will relearn the association that your bed is the place where you're asleep. So you're 100% right. That's exactly what we recommend. To your second question, which is sleep inertia, it's a real thing. Sleep inertia is typically where we wake up and your brain requires some time to kind of warm up to operating temperature, like an old vintage car. You know, you can't just turn the engine on and start, you know, flooring it and going up to red line. You need to sort of circulate the fluids and warm the oil up and get the engine warm. And then you can really start to push it. It's the same way with our brain in some ways. Now, different people have different severities of sleep inertia. I'm actually like you. I suffer from quite bad sleep inertia. Sleep inertia typically happens in very severe amounts if you're mismatched between your sleep schedule and your chronotype schedule. And so you can go on um, and you can go online and type Google um, morningness, eveningness questionnaire. And it's a questionnaire that you fill out and it figures out what your chronotype is. Are you um, a morning type? somewhere in between, or are you an evening type? And what we find is that morning types, when they wake up in the morning at their normal time, which is very early or early, they don't have sleep inertia. They're good to go. They can jump into the gym and they're like energizer bunnies and they're all happy and, you know, joyful. And to me, I'm just like, oh, <laughs> you know, uh, whereas evening types waking up at the time that morning types have to wake up, which is in some ways the way society is designed. Society is desperately biased against evening types and wrongfully so because it's not your fault. It's genetically determined. There are about six or seven genes that we know right now that dictate what your chronotype is. It's not your fault. It's gifted to you at birth. Um, you don't get to choose. Now, if you are suffering from sleep inertia, what we find is that if you can sleep a little bit later into the morning, go to bed maybe a little bit later, sleep later, play around with that and see if the speed with which you wake up is better, that your sleep inertia is less. That's one way. It may not always work. Another way is temperature. Now, it turns out that when people have a cup of coffee, they say, look, I just need like five minutes and I, I swig a couple of you know mouthfuls of coffee and now I'm alert. That's nonsense. Caffeine doesn't actually get into your system until about 12 to 15 minutes. So if you're feeling any effects of caffeine before that, it's not the caffeine. It turns out that when we go to sleep, <clears throat> we drop our, our core body temperature. We get very cold, we become almost hypothermic. Now to wake up, we have to warm up. So to, to get to sleep, we need to get cold. To stay asleep, we need to stay cold. And to wake up, we need to warm up. And so one way that you can artificially accelerate or try accelerating your inertia in a quicker dissipating manner is to try to warm up more quickly. So get a hot drink in the morning. It doesn't have to be caffeine if that's not your thing. I don't drink caffeine, but I'm not against it. Caffeine is an issue. It's not the, really the dose that makes the poison. It's the timing that makes the poison when it comes to sleep and caffeine, which we can come on to. But drink a hot drink, get your body temperature up. If you like, if you've got a smart thermostat, program it to start to rise temperature in your bedroom or in the house in the last hour before your alarm. And you can, it can really start to help you wake up. 